I don't know. I mean, it's like a good sci-fi show, but it just doesn't feel like Star Trek. This is a review of the pilot episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Emissary. If you have not seen this episode and you don't want to know what happens in it, be warned, spoilers beyond this point. Last time I reviewed Encounter at Farpoint, the worst Star Trek pilot, and this time I'm reviewing Emissary, the best Star Trek pilot. When you watch Emissary, whether you're familiar with Deep Space Nine or you're seeing it for the first time, right away it's obvious that the creators of this show have a lot of ideas and a lot of ambition. One of those ambitions, the most immediately apparent one, is to make this a different show than Star Trek The Next Generation. That in and of itself is a gutsy decision because Deep Space Nine debuted during the sixth season of TNG, by which time TNG had become an institution beloved by Trekkies as well as a generally popular, critically appreciated series. It's kind of extraordinary for the creators of Deep Space Nine to make such a point of staking out their own territory, of signaling to their audience of presumably mostly TNG viewers that Deep Space Nine was not going to be a second hour of TNG. We get that message from the first scene of the episode, where we're taken back to the Battle of Wolf 359, which took place at the beginning of Season 4 of TNG when Captain Picard had been assimilated by the Borg and, as Locutus, was leading a Borg cube to attack Earth. A fleet of Federation starships intercept the Borg and put up a valiant but hopeless fight. In the TNG episode, we don't actually see the Battle of Wolf 359, only its aftermath. In Emissary, we see the battle from the perspective of Ben Sisko, then the first officer of the USS Saratoga, and it is rough. The ship is severely damaged and has to be abandoned. Sisko's wife, Jennifer, is killed. And Sisko has to be pulled away from her body and dragged, weeping, to an escape pod. He watches silently from a window of that escape pod as, moments later, the ship explodes. Now, I'm not saying Star Trek didn't have serious moments before this. It did. The death of Edith Keeler in The City on the Edge of Forever the death of Spock in Star Trek II, the murder of Kirk's son David in Star Trek III, Picard's torture at the hands of Gul Madred in Chain of Command, which, incidentally, was the last episode of TNG that aired before Deep Space Nine premiered. But even within the context of those earlier examples, Jennifer's death and Sisko's distraught reaction to it are emotionally raw and pretty heavy. And it's the first scene of the first episode. It's as if the creators of the series are telling us up front, hey, we ain't screwing around. That opening doesn't just set a distinctive emotional tone for the episode in the series, it also begins Ben Sisko's character arc for the episode and the series. But I want to focus on the former because this is a review of the episode and not the series. And also because the lead protagonist actually having a meaningful character arc is not a standard feature of Star Trek pilots. Pike and Kirk don't really have one in their respective pilots. Picard doesn't really have one in Encounter at Farpoint. I'll talk about Janeway and Archer when I get to those episodes, but they don't really have character arcs in their first episodes either. We establish their personalities, we see them making decisions that drive the plot and show us things about them, but they don't really change or grow during the course of the story. Emissary, on the other hand, not only gives Ben Sisko a character arc, it makes his character arc the emotional centerpiece of the episode. After that wrenching first scene, we jump ahead three years as Sisko and his teenage son Jake, who also escaped the Saratoga, are about to arrive at Deep Space Nine, where Ben is to begin his new assignment as Starfleet Commander of the Station. Despite his outward confidence, it soon becomes clear that Ben is still deeply traumatized by the loss of his wife. He has a meeting with Captain Picard that is awkward and borderline hostile 
due to Sisko's lingering resentment over Picard's role as Locutus in the destruction of the Saratoga and the death of his wife. Another brave choice by the creators of this show, establishing right away that the lead protagonist of this new series despises the beloved lead protagonist of the previous series. He discloses that he isn't happy with this posting to Deep Space Nine and is considering resigning from Starfleet in order to return to Earth. An encounter with a Bajoran orb results in a vision of the day he met Jennifer, which leaves him shaken, and when he and Dax discover the wormhole, he has another, much longer vision, a direct encounter with the Prophets that ultimately leads him to confront just how much unresolved grief and trauma he's been living with. As much of an impact as that first scene has, I think the culmination of Sisko's encounter with the Prophets in the wormhole is even more powerful. He tries to explain to the prophets who don't experience the passage of time what it means to have a linear existence, to have a past, present, and future. But the prophets are confused. If the past is gone and cannot be returned to, why is it that Sisko can't seem to move beyond his own past, in particular the death of Jennifer? You exist here, the prophets, one of whom has taken the form of Jennifer, tell him, it is not linear. And Sisko is forced to tearfully admit that no, it's not linear. He doesn't instantly resolve all of his trauma, but he does face it and acknowledge it. And when he meets a second time with Captain Picard, he informs Picard that he's decided not to resign after all. And while the two of them aren't exactly chummy, Sisko and Picard part on a note of mutual respect, which is markedly different from the simmering tension that hung between them the first time. I should mention that it's not all weeping and wailing for Sisko here. The episode also establishes that he's a dad, and a good one, which gives him a dimension previous Star Trek lead protagonists haven't had, and becomes a very important part of the series. I know I've just been talking about Sisko this whole time, but... His story in this episode is really what lifts it up above all the other first episodes in the franchise and makes it not only a good pilot, but a good episode, period. There are other factors that contribute to both of those as well, however. The episode does a good job of introducing us to the rest of the cast. Apart from Kira and O'Brien, we don't spend a whole lot of time with any of them, but we at least get a sense of who they are. Odo, the shape-shifting security guard who is gruff but harbors hidden pain over not knowing where he came from. Bashir, the brash young doctor who has come to DS9 hoping to prove himself a hero on the frontier. Dax, the young Trill science officer who carries the memories of a few hundred years worth of past lifetimes. Quark, the local saloon keeper, underworld operator, and all-around likable scumbag. Speaking of likable scumbags, or dramatically compelling ones at least, we also meet Gul Dukat, who will become one of the series' most important recurring characters and establishes himself right away as a threatening and charismatic antagonist. And speaking of recurring characters, we also meet Kai Opaka, the Bajoran space pope, who projects warmth, wisdom, and dignity while delivering some of the episode's goofiest dialogue. She's great, but don't get attached. Major Kira is introduced as a short-tempered hard-ass, and the episode does a good job of establishing her as something other than a clone of TNG's Ro Laren, though there are still some similarities owing to the fact that in earlier stages of the show's development, Kira's character was literally <laughs> Ro Laren. Her adversarial but respectful relationship with Sisko is established, as well as her history with and distrust of the Cardassians, and her antagonism toward Quark. Chief O'Brien is reintroduced after spending five and a half seasons as a recurring character on TNG. It turns out the guy who's been running the transporter on the Enterprise all these years was also an engineering genius. How about that? I kid, it's not entirely out of left field. We saw hints of O'Brien's technical expertise here and there on TNG. In Emissary, thanks to the extended feature-length running time, 
we get to see O'Brien's farewell to the Enterprise. It's a nice little scene with Captain Picard that probably wouldn't make the cut in a shorter, tighter episode, but here there's room for it. And we not only get the lovely reversal of Captain Picard operating the transporter for O'Brien, we also learn that O'Brien actually had a favorite transporter room, the dork. Beyond introducing its characters, Emissary also establishes the space station itself as a compelling setting. And once again, it's different from what we're used to from TNG. Unlike the Enterprise-D, which is bright, and spacious and almost absurdly comfortable, Deep Space Nine is dark and industrial. There's a grandeur to it, but in a looming, menacing way, like a Gothic cathedral. It's a place now occupied by people who did not design it, who are using it for something other than its intended purpose. It's not new and sleek and state-of-the-art like the Enterprise. It's old and used and in need of refurbishment. And as a result of all that, it feels positively ripe with dramatic potential. Along with its solid character work and interesting setting, Emissary is also packed full of ideas. It introduces or reintroduces concepts that will be important to the series as it moves forward, such as the history of conflict between Bajor and Cardassia, the Bajoran religion, and Sisko's status as the Emissary, the wormhole, the prophets. It introduces the orbs and establishes the conceit of the prophets assuming the forms of other characters in order to communicate. We get Cisco and Dax entering the wormhole for the first time and seeing two different environments apparently based on their own perceptions, a bright, beautiful setting for Dax and a stormy, desolate landscape for Cisco. And we get Sisko's surreal extended vision, where he relives moments from his life and processes his own grief, while also using baseball as a metaphor to explain linear existence to the prophets. There's a lot. Emissary is an excellent first episode that establishes everything it needs to establish, gets several balls rolling that will be important to the series going forward, and also manages to tell a complete story with a beginning, middle, and end that meaningfully centers its lead protagonist. It's the best of all the Star Trek pilots, which is only fitting because it's the pilot for the best of all the Star Trek shows. Those are my thoughts on the first episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Please do share your thoughts in the comments if you'd like to support this channel and I sure wish you would, if you can afford it. You can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button, or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. I'll be back next week for a retro review of the series premiere of Star Trek Voyager, Caretaker. Thanks for watching. And take care, everybody.